Hello, Ed. Nice to see you. Here I am. Here I am. <laughs> and here you are. Um, so, uh, uh, to our audience, I hope you all have been enjoying the gallery and enjoyed the concert and the talks today. Um, as I mentioned, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Ed Bell to you, um, whose work I've been following for many years and who I had the pleasure of meeting a number of years ago at uh, SciViz NYC, which is an annual scientific visualization conference. Ed's video, Other Worlds Near and Far, is included in our exhibition which opened today online, as you well know, and will actually be live for the next year. Um, so to tell you a bit more about Ed, he is the art director of Scientific American. He is also an adjunct professor at the Polytechnic University of Brooklyn, a lecturer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and California State University Scientific American Online. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Ed. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. I appreciate it. Um, I guess I just want to um, add that um, I am running a studio. By the way, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me, Julia? Yes, very well. Okay, so yes, I do run my own studio called Matrix Design Films, and um, where I'm a freelance animator. I animate for myself and for clients. The work I do for myself is mostly exoplanets and the work I do for clients though is mostly um, around our local solar system. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about each um, in a minute. Matter of fact, I may as well get started now. Let me share my screen. So let me start by saying that um, I love illustrating and animating the planetary sciences. Again, if I'm not doing it for a client, I'm doing it for myself. As the art director at Scientific American, I was honored to collaborate with other space artists, um, all of them more richly talented than myself. And a partial list would include Pat Rawlings, Dan Durda, Joe Turuccioni, and uh, Don Dixon, who's currently the art director at the Griffith Observatory and whose work you're looking at now. And also um, probably my greatest collaboration has been with award-winning uh, artists Ron Miller, whose illustrations have graced the pages of Scientific American for many, many years. All of these people are members of the Association, the International Association of Astronomical Artists. And I have to say that this organization is brimming with talent. When I left Scientific American, some four decades or after four decades uh, being there, I teamed up with Ron Miller to produce the book app Julia just mentioned, for the publishers Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud, titled Journey to the Exoplanets. I wrote the copy, and Ron provided all the beautiful illustrations. This was 10 years ago, and at that time, I enthusiastically wrote that there were more than 400 exoplanets discovered and confirmed. Uh, and now, as has been previously mentioned by other panelists, there are more than 4,000 confirmed exoplanets. It's now generally believed that there are more planets in the cosmos than stars. So I'll be, uh, I'll be animating for quite a while. After I'd finished the book is when I decided to teach myself animation. Once again, I turned to my friend Ron and asked if I could animate a few of his digital paintings. This was the first one that I attempted. It's an image of two alien plants on Gliese 581G. It was a fairly simple animation and I, I did it in After Effects and it's really not that good, but I had been fully bitten by the animation bug by now. And about a year later, I got a call from Nova TV producer, Terry Randall. Ron had told her that I was animating his work. She asked me if I would supply some animations of Pluto for a documentary they were producing. At that time, this was the best image of Pluto that astronomers had. And this might be a good time to, you know, talk about what considerations are given to creating images of things that have never been seen. This blurry image of Pluto is for, for the artist. It's a good news, bad news situation. On the one hand, it gives the artist a great deal of leeway to use his or her imagination. On the other hand, it offers many opportunities to simply be wrong. 
Charles Knight, the father of paleontological art, and Chesley Bonestell, the father of astronomical art, were also faced with this dilemma. Given a handful of bones, Knight would create wonderful scenes recreating animals that no one had ever seen. Similarly, Bonestell depicted detailed views of worlds which were based on images almost as blurry as our Pluto photo. Knight used whatever information he could get from scientists and filled in the gaps with what he knew of his own world. In this case, in this image, he depicts a leaping T-Rex because he knows that this behavior is one that's used by some reptiles in his time. Similarly, Bonestell knows that snow and mountains are common on our planet, so why not on Titan also? Time would prove both of them wrong, but it, it really didn't matter uh, much as both artists captured the fascination of the public, helping to grow the fields of paleontology and astronomy. As for my Pluto animations, the reality of the discoveries of the New Horizons satellite were far greater than anyone had imagined. In the case of Pluto, it was suspected that there, were, there would be like bright icy areas and dark dry areas very near each other. And because Pluto's distance from the sun varied, sublimation of its volatiles would occur, causing them to rise up into the thin, tenuous Plutonian atmosphere. And when it's nearer the sun, freezing of the volatiles occurs and a light methane snow, a light methane snow would, would gently fall back to the surface of the dwarf planet. A few scientists had predicted that there might be liquid neon on Pluto's surface. Fortunately, we didn't use this scene in the documentary as no evidence of this was discovered. Note that this scene and the two previous scenes are animations done directly in After Effects using Ron Miller's paintings. In a documentary on Titan that I was asked to work on, the producer, again, Terry Randall, who's by the way, an extraordinary producer and a great storyteller, wanted to make comparisons between Titan and Earth. This led to a number of conversations with Cornell, Cornell Professor of Astronomy, Alexander Hayes. Unlike Pluto, the Cassini spacecraft and the Huygens probe had provided an enormous amount of data on Titan. Visualizing that data meant asking a lot of interesting questions, questions that we knew we could get answers to. Questions like, when it rains on Titan, how fast do the liquid raindrops fall? And what are the size of the raindrops? And what shape do the raindrops take? Do the liquid methane lakes have large waves? And what is the color? What color is the liquid methane? What does it sound like on Titan? Well, to answer that question, we, we had uh, Professor Hayes answer it directly. I actually placed him in a scene on Titan and here's what he said. Sound travels faster than it does here on Earth and the sound of the waves will be coming to us faster, more compressed, and perhaps to perceive the slightly higher pitch. My voice itself will sound a little bit more alien and complex, but I hope you're holding your breath because while Titan's atmosphere is predominantly nitrogen, just like Earth, there is very little to no oxygen to speak of. And if you can visualize all of this, I'd like to welcome you to Titan. When animating another world, especially an exoplanet about which you have few facts, using what actual knowledge you do have becomes critical. An artist submitted this image of Gliese 581c, depicting it as having three moons and having water on its surface. But we knew this planet was almost certainly tidally locked, meaning one face of the planet always faces its sun. This likelihood strongly diminished the chances that this would have, that this planet would have plenty of liquid water. So we had the image redone to keep it more in the realm of science and less in the realm of fantasy. For me, accuracy is everything. It's a science illustration. If I can get it to look great also, that's icing on the cake. But let's get it right first. 
When depicting life on exoplanets, especially plants, don't be too quick to show them as green. With the vast majority of stars being red dwarfs, green plants would be a distinct minority due to the wavelengths of the light coming from the star. And if the planet is in a double red dwarf system, you can expect to find plenty of black plants on that world. Uh, Nancy Kiang wrote a wonderful article in Scientific American on this very subject, and I highly recommend uh, looking it up if you're really interested in, in how to depict plants on your alien uh, exoplanet worlds. It's not often that I'll depict alien life forms. In talking with Seth Shostak, the senior scientist at the Institute for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, he reminded me that many life forms are shaped by their physical environment. For instance, fish are shaped the way they are because it makes movement through a liquid medium much easier. To keep myself honest, I imagine what the environment of my alien life forms would be like. But with the enormous diversity of life forms in our own planet, coming up with a truly original one is not really easy. A friend of mine recently asked, what was that piece of carpet moving in the background? Well, that's when I decided to stop making aliens. Occasionally, I'm asked to produce an animation that borders on a thought experiment when a scientist told Nova that the density of Saturn was so low that you could drop the planet, if you, if you could drop it, in a gigantic ocean, it would float. And that's when my phone rang. We ended up showing this. <laughs> Similarly, the recently visited, uh, what's the name of it? Bennu, asteroid Bennu, was found to be not as solid as suspected, Rather, it's a loose collection of rocks held together by its own minimal gravity. If it were captured and brought back and placed on the ground here on Earth, it would simply collapse from the force of Earth's gravity. Once again, my phone rang. Here's Bennu. We thought it might be fun to have it collapse in our own famous meteor crater. Occasionally, I'm asked to have the scientists interact with the animations that I supply, and this can be tricky and time consuming, as scientists are not trained actors, or should they be, and getting them to do exactly what you want can be difficult. But that was not the case with Dr. David Jewett, the lead scientist of the New Horizons mission. He was asked to give a general explanation of the layout of our solar system. He was placed in a room with little furniture and told to imagine that there was a table in front of him and to imagine the solar system would be hovering above the table. Well, Dr. Jewett nailed it in one take. When I received the video, I was ecstatic to see how easy he had made my life. Here's a brief overview of how this all came together. First, I'll show you the raw video. After Pluto was discovered, the solar system uh, basically was thought to be a pretty well-known uh, system. So in the middle sits the sun, the sun is this massive body made of hydrogen. It's a million times the mass of the Earth and about a uh, hundred times the diameter of the Earth. And it's orbited by planets which are moving uh, in nearly circular orbits. And then uh, at the very edge, the outer edge of this system of uh, planets, we deal with Pluto. And Pluto is not really like a terrestrial planet uh, because it's uh, got quite a bit of ice in it. And Pluto is not at all like a giant planet because it's tiny. And it's not made of gas, it's made of solid material. And it also has a very strange orbit with a high ellipticity and a high inclination. It's tilted up relative to the plane of the solar system. And Pluto was regarded as a planet, but it was always regarded as a kind of a funny planet, a weird planet, somewhat out of place. Beyond Pluto, uh, there was nothing. And people actually didn't think about that in general because it's just an empty space. And next stop, uh, the stars. So I was amazed at how good Dr. Jewett was. Um, he made wonderful hand gestures um, to things that weren't there. He made eye contact with things that weren't there. And um, I was very grateful for his participation and making this so easy. First thing I had to do was 
get a table in front of him, which meant going to my 3D program, modeling a table, and this is um, what it ended up looking like. And here I'm moving a light around the table so that I can see that it will look natural in, um, in almost any lighting uh, condition. And then the second step is to put the table in the, the sun uh, is this massive video. body made of hydrogen. It's a million times the mass of the Earth and about a uh, hundred times the diameter of the Earth. And it's orbited by planets which are moving uh, in nearly circular orbits. The first few planets, the Mercury, Venus. So now that that was done, the last step, which was um, the most rewarding, was to actually depict what he was talking about. And here's how the final scene ended up. After Pluto was discovered, the solar system uh, basically was thought to be a pretty well-known uh, system. So in the middle sits the sun. The sun is this massive body made of hydrogen. It's a million times the mass of the Earth and about a uh, hundred times the diameter of the Earth. And it's orbited by planets, which are moving uh, in nearly circular orbits. And then uh, at the very edge, the outer edge of this system of uh, planets, we do Pluto. And Pluto is not really like a terrestrial planet. Uh, because it's uh, got quite a bit of ice in it. And Pluto is not at all like a giant planet because it's tiny and it's not made of gas, it's made of solid material. And it also has a very strange orbit with a high ellipticity and a high inclination. It's tilted up relative to the plane of the solar system. So kudos to Dr. Jewett, who I thought did a marvelous job with that. I currently do most of my animation in a program called Lightwave. In this shot, I'm inside the lightweight program itself. And in this scene, everything is textured and I've got it lit uh, the way I want it. And so now I'm repositioning the camera to make a final render. For this particular scene, this is what the final render looked like. Even in my own personal work, I try to invent reasons for what I'm depicting. Why is this structure on the planet? What do the people do there? I do this to try to keep my work in the realm of science, to give, to give my work some honesty. And again, to keep it from just being a, a fantasy or some fantastical piece. Often in my work, I'll depict an old spacecraft or terraform machine abandoned, perhaps a failed mission. I believe that, that this will happen more often than, than we'll be comfortable with in the future. Space is always trying to kill us and its exploration will have a cost. I hope there will be discoveries like this beach on a moon of Tau Ceti F. And this scene is a composite of 3D models, beach and sand and sea rocks plus the video of water and a matte painting sky background. Much of my work involves this type of compositing. Note that in this explosion that I'm about to show you, the entire scene is composited in After Effects. However, when I'm creating planets that are seen from space, I use an After Effects plugin called Orb. And it allows for the creation of, of high quality, cinema quality planets. And best of all, it's a free plugin. It's put out by the company Video Copilot. Here, here is a picture of Ross 128B which I've done in Orb, in After Effects. And this is uh, Mar Mars, three billion years ago, when it had water, also done in After Effects using the plugin Orb. Most recently, I've been experimenting with a program called Unreal Engine. And this program is primarily designed for the gaming industry, of which I'm not involved. I don't play games. But uh, it has been expanding into the film industry. 
and increased editorial usage, which is one of the reasons why I'm looking into it. Its ability to create hyper-realistic and very large scale uh, environments based on variables that the user inputs has made this one of the fastest growing software companies. And full disclosure, uh, these scenes you're seeing right now are from a demo from Unreal Engine. I'm still in the early stages of learning this software, which by the way, is free for use for editorial purposes. Um, I'm at the end now of my, uh, my presentation. I just wanna say one other thing um, that all of you who can, please try and support you know, your local public broadcasting stations. And if you can, please support Nova Television. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to listen to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Ed, that was wonderful. Um, if you wanna exit screen sharing, we can have a bit of a conversation um, okay. with the questions that we're getting in. So yes, if you have questions for Ed, there is still time to submit them via the chat box on Zoom or the chat box on the gallery website. Um, so I wanted to start out with um, talking about the relationship between science and science visualization. So as the art director of Scientific American, which by the way, if uh, people who don't know this, it's actually the longest running science magazine, uh, you were really responsible for ushering the magazine and its wonderful illustrations into the digital era and experiencing that switchover, um, which has made, I think, the sharing of science uh, visualization um, just have such a broader impact, you know, getting on social media and everything. And while articles can paint us a picture with uh, words, scientific illustration really has the power to show us what we cannot see underneath the Earth's crust, inside the heart's four chambers, far out into space. And these images make a deep impact on the public. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit, uh, if you have any thoughts about how scientific illustration may have contributed to the science that it centers around, or um, if it's influenced maybe the approach that researchers that you have been in touch with, um, if it's influenced their approach to the discoveries that they make, kind of seeing it visualized in a way that they couldn't do themselves, but artists like you do on a regular basis. Well, uh, yeah, I can't say that I've personally um, gotten that information directly from scientists. However, um, anecdotally, I keep hearing that um, uh, many scientists um, have either been inspired or got involved in their research because of some, some physical uh, artistic medium that they pre presented with, um, whether it be um, Kubrick's 2001, uh, A Space Odyssey, or, or the books of, of Tolkien or, or anything like that. Um, I hear that so often that um, it makes me realize more and more that, that there's definitely a synergy between art and science, which is one of the reasons why I applaud what you're doing, um, Julia. It, there's definitely a, a handshake or a marriage going on there that benefits both, uh, both sides. So. Yeah, well, I can't speak specifically to um, uh, individual scientists who may have uh, gone into uh, their, their uh, field because of art. I know this happens very often. I've certainly heard similar stories. And, and yeah, maybe, um, maybe a whole new generation of scientists has been inspired just by, by virtue of the fact that these images are so available now in our digital era. Um, we have a couple questions about how you decided to go into this career. Um, you know, what, what made you interested in science visualization in the first place? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I actually came to Scientific American many years ago in the hopes of being a writer because um, I had majored um, both in science and journalism. And um, that didn't work out, but what did work out was I began to be mentored by the then art director, Jerome Snyder, whose name I'm pleased to be able to announce, um, mention. Uh, he's no longer with us, uh, he's with me, but um, he spent a lot of time teaching me about design. Um, and because of that, I went back to school to learn more about art. All the while this is going on though, I had this 
fascination with um, the moving image, with, with animation, beginning, uh, as I mentioned, with um, the film 2001, A Space Odyssey, but even including um, uh, sort of second rate films like the uh, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, um, which I distinctly remember a, a scene in which a skeleton um, sword fights Sinbad was done in stop motion animation. And I was fascinated that, that this kind of thing could even occur and look so real. Um, so all the while I was learning art and design in the back of my mind, I kept saying, I wish I could do some animation. I wish I could do some animation. My eventual ascension to the art director's chair left a little, little time for that. But once I left the magazine, I was able to, to make that left turn and, and, and say, all right, let's do it. It was scary at first because it meant dropping everything I knew and, and looking at a steep learning curve, but um, I'm so glad I did it. Yeah, we had some uh, other questions from the audience about you know, how you taught yourself animation and how kind of daunting a task that might be. Do you have any advice for people who are looking to do that themselves? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the reasons I chose the 3D software that I did cho choose was because I had two friends who were already using it. Invariably, when you're gonna learn something new, you're gonna, you're gonna hit a wall and you're just not gonna be able to solve a problem. And there's nothing really more frustrating than not being able to move forward. Um, the other thing is, and I think maybe everybody knows that, there's probably nothing that's not on YouTube. Um, if you type in Google how to, 10 billion things will pop up and you'll choose the one you want. Um, so I spent an awful lot of time solving problems um, in YouTube and um, leaning, leaning on friends. But I think the big thing is if you love doing something, just, just keep doing it. Um, the curve will get shallower and shallower and you'll see your work get better and better. I would also advise, cause I fell into this, this trap um, after the first couple of years, I was so taken with what I was producing that I would you know, send it to friends, look, what, look at this animation. And several years later, when I looked back at what I was sending out, I was horrified to realize how, how terrible it was. So don't fall too in love with uh, your early work. Sort of master the medium uh, before you start disseminating it. That's really good advice. <laughs> um, oh, well, I wish we had more time, but as usual with all great presentations, which this day has been full of, uh, we're out of time because uh, we have so much to talk about. Um, so, uh, before handing it over to the next artist talk, I just want to say thank you so much, Ed, for uh, joining us here today. And again, you can view his piece, uh, his video piece within our gallery amongst all of the other artworks. Uh, but yes, thank you again, Ed. Thanks, Julie. Appreciate it.